Welcome. You're watching Physical Activity Researcher podcast. Interviews with world-leading physical activity researchers. Welcome. You're watching Physical Activity Researcher podcast. Interviews with world-leading physical activity researchers. Welcome everyone. In this episode, we are going to talk about physical activity recommendations and training of children and also new research design ideas with children. And we have an interesting guest for this episode. He has been working over 10 years as an ice hockey coach for 12 to 20 years old. Currently, he's doing his sport and exercise medicine master's degree in the University of Uvascula. And part of his master's internship in industry, for my great pleasure, Jaakko has been doing his internship at Fibian. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Mr. Jaakko Alasarla. Welcome, Jaakko. Thanks for having me, Olli. It's a nice pleasure to be here. Um, if we move from the from the sport training more in the measurement, as a, as an intern, you were working on on our new ebook about measurement of sedentary behavior and and physical activity in children. What did you What did you learn in the in the process about measurement? I think the main point is that nowadays we have a lot of different devices that we can use for measurement of physical activity. And especially for the research use, we should focus on the accelerometers, how we can get the valid data, raw data out of, how we can compare the different times and different activity levels. That's the main point that I think it's good that we have sport watches and different kind of methods. You can get the activity trackers on the phone and so on. It's good. It's kind of improving our well-being. If we want to improve their health science, sport science, and so on, we should focus on that we get the valid data and how much the activity levels are, what are the intensities. Mm. And and you were also also innovating new new research design possibilities that are enabled with the with the new technology that provides much longer measurement time easier could you could you tell what kind of research designs and research ideas you came came up with yeah so basically i was working more that what we can do that we can see how much our children are moving during the year during the different seasonal changes especially in finland because we have long winters short summers what we can do to measure that during the winter time it's cold it's a lot of snow maybe it's raining water at sometimes <laughs> so is that changing what we can do during the summer when it's the sunny side of the year so that's mm-hmm. one of the things that we also what i was thinking about in finland we kind of use a lot of different periods during our school year if we add physical education or if we have longer recess breaks during the school day, how much that affects in our physical activity during the days or during the months. And then we can really find out the ways that we can improve the, the physical activity and get less sedentary behavior in children. Mm. And and how do you how do you see this uh you you are working with the uh, student student athletes and and there is some pe in the school and like you said that for example the the high school is having kind of periods i think one semester is divided is divided to three periods and then you have different subject that you study how, how do you how do you see that system working and could it be improved some way yeah I- think that in a 
now I'm working with the student athletes who are in high school. We have three times of morning practice sessions. So as an athlete, it's kind of easy in Finland to get the amount of active physical activity. But when we compare that, I'm not sure how much courses you have to take physical education in the high schools for nowadays. But I remember that during my high school year, it was two in three years. Mm. So basically only six to 12 weeks of physical education. And if we don't have that in every year or every period, and we are not active by our mm. leisure time, what that means for our health. So we should focus on that we could add the physical education in different methods. Mm. Maybe it's optional, maybe it's mandatory, but we have to find out that children and adolescents, they should have to focus that they move enough because nowadays it looks like they're not moving enough. Mm. And and do you think it has a not so good idea that the PE is also periodized, that it's maybe you have two months that you don't have PE, should it be divided for the whole whole two semesters that you'd be getting it kind of all the time? Yeah, I think it's good option should be that once a week you should have a physical education lesson, mm. even in high school, because that is the time when the school is coming more stressful, different subjects, harder courses, have to learn more and more. And what we can have in physical activity is that we can improve the learning. Mm. So if we can keep that physical activity levels and increase it, maybe that will affect also that we will have the better learning experiences even mm. in high school age. Mm. So basically you could make a research design that you have kind of different, you are changing the different periods and, and the PE within them and switching and, and you could also test different length of recess that how does it affect the, the physical activity levels. Yeah, I think that's one of the important notes that, and I think myself is that If we have 45 minute lesson and 15 minute recess, should we change that 20 minute recess, 40 mm. minute lecture? That could mm. be one way that we have five more minutes chance to have more physical activity. If we have that three times, it also always makes one hour per day. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And the other one you said that studying the seasonal changes yeah in different countries it might be, have a smaller effect but there is anyway for students there is time for summer for for christmas uh, when they are off and and yeah i mean everywhere in in europe the seasons are changing and that's very much in finland where the the winter is very very dark and you actually many adults switch to cross-country skiing because that's possible and in Finland with some age groups I think with the older people we see that they are more active in the winter because they they like skiing so but I think it's a good idea to study study the seasonal changes of, of sedentary behavior and, and physical activity yeah and of course one thing in Finland is also that we have the sunlight for three hours during the December so If we go to school from eight to four, okay, you don't see the sun at the whole month. So how we can adapt to that, that during the light time, even though maybe three times sunlight, we should focus that to stay outside, maybe have something lectures outside. How can that improve our well-being and mm. not so on that we are staying in the dark all the time. Yeah, that's for for students. That's that's important. As an, if you are kind of uh, working with the flexible schedule, I would recommend you to putting in winter, like from eleven to one, just preserve time for being outside and having having a for a lunch break. Just take that off and work a little bit longer in the in the evening. I think that's that works if you have the luxury of of doing that. But I think it's important to do the get the sunlight and also uh, it 
it's much nicer to do outdoor activities when the sun is actually up there and not, not in the total darkness. Yeah, but also I have to say that skiing in the moonlight is always a nice pleasure. Yeah, it is. Yeah, did you have any any other research design ideas? Yeah, I think that if if we look at the, like for example sports science and how we can measure the physical activity for like children age of 10 to 14 what happens during the practice sessions if we mm-hmm. have two hour time and we try to focus on to get the moderate uh, activity levels vigorous activity levels how we can get those during our practice sessions because if the children move during their recess they probably have the luxury to have breaks during the games and so on so do we get to the vigorous activity levels during the school days or during the physical education lectures and if we don't get to those then if our children are participating in sports, we should focus that we get to that vigorous activity levels because it will improve our health and well-being for a longer time. Mm. Yeah, I, I think some of those are pretty interesting when you have done done like objective measurements of PE. PE lessons, for example, it's it can be surprisingly low duration and what, what children are actually being physically active because it might be children, uh, teachers talking, showing something, and and the actual actual activity. They might be waiting for their turn to do something, which which is kind of yeah, not not the optimal way to spend a PE class. Yeah, I think one of the my best experience, what I learned from other coaches, is that even though the children are adolescents, if they're age fifteen or sixteen, you can always play tag during the mm. practice and yeah. you always get higher intensities one yeah. way is to play air guitar tag or something else then they will first look at you that okay now the coach has lost his mind and we are doing this kind of playing here but take five minutes or ten minutes and then they are running and then they are doing the moves and different kind of showing up so mm. that's one way we can improve our practice sessions in sports clubs mm, yeah that's 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 important and and some coaches or it's quite natural to think that good coaching is that you you are coaching you are explaining things you are showing but usually during that time your athletes are not actually practicing so many times it's better to kind of coach less and let just do do more yeah we have to let the kids explored what is to mm. play sports or what is to have some different hobbies let them explore their moves let them enjoy that's the main thing what we should focus on if we coach especially mm. in children because that makes the opportunities to develop athletes in the future because they have the amount of physical activities higher they have more skills to do different kind of moves it's not maybe nice okay you have good moderate knowledge you have developed the models how to move and that can increase your chance to do different things on ice for example mm, yeah good good points uh did you have any any other research design ideas yeah i think that the, one of the ways that we can use today using our cloud service what fibion is changing that we can control which time we are measuring and compare with the compare the physical activity during the school days weekend days for longer periods because we know that especially in children the school days the weekdays they are more active and weekend days they don't have that much activity at least Mm -hmm. the studies in finland shows that so how we can compare that, for example, weekdays, Monday to fr- Thursday, what is the activity levels, let's say, for five months? And mm. let's compare those to Friday to 
Sunday, what are the activity levels on Friday to Sunday. And getting the longer data for five months, for example, it shows us the seasonal changes. It shows that if we have in sports, if we have competitive season, do we get enough activity during mm. the weekend days, for example? Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's that's important. And when you when you really measure or track something for a longer time, it might be really simple findings that you find, but you didn't really know. I think a good example is this weight gain study from US that they were just tracking people's weight for a longer time. And they noticed that people are, they have a balanced uh, intake and expenditure most of the year. But then there's this holiday season when there's the Thanksgiving Day, Christmas, and and many people were just gaining always like a couple of kilos those times and then they were the normal weight and then again gaining at, at those holiday seasons. And that's that's super important for the interventions that you actually just need to control that people wouldn't gain weight during the holiday season and then they would actually stay normal. But if you every year gain one to two kilos in the holiday season and are not able to drop it it's it's quite a bit in in 10 20 years yeah and so that what is the if we want to lose weight for example or control the weight what is the differences for example our physical activities that maybe we're active more active during the weekdays then we go the weekends we're not that active physically and during the weekend days we might be used eat better eat more have some treats and it kind of we cannot control the weight anymore because maybe we eat over during mm. the weekend days yeah it just just came to my mind how how is the ice hockey training in in finland do you do you have like sunday off or how, how is it scheduled the training well, you should during the competitive season, the Saturdays and Sundays are for the game days. Yeah. And especially then we like to have a one off day. Usually it's Monday or Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get the practice sessions on Thursday, Friday, Tuesday. Mm. Yeah. I think with the many recreational sport clubs, I found it annoying that the Sundays are off because Sundays you have a lot of time you would easily have time to do but sometimes the weekdays might be much more challenging so I find it annoying that they are not open in the clubs are not open in the in the weekend when you would really have have time to do or they close maybe early early so yeah I think that's something that could be improved yeah I like see to look at that for smaller children they have the sports and exercises what they participate and mostly there on tuesdays wednesdays thursdays they're starting five o'clock maybe mm. in different side of the city and then the parents go quickly go from work to home get the children in the car and move there next and then you get back and okay the whole evening was there the children get 40 minutes of physical activity that's good and the parents mm. get the very stressful experience yeah yeah that's that's challenging yeah quite common yeah any any other research ideas well maybe for the phibian circadian what is good for also the phibian kids compared to those that the sleep wake patterns of children and adolescents because we know the circadian rhythm is different from adolescents compared to adults so how we can change that do we mm. really have to start the school days later so let's say 10 a.m instead of 8 a.m and if the children want to have enough sleep eight to nine hours for every night and they get tired after 11 p.m or 12 p.m mm. so how we can change that how we can find out the research what are the differences when we are working with the children and adolescents are they tired in the early evening or do they get tired in the late evening so 
Mm. And and how how is the you said that the in ice hockey the ice time is is limited. What is the latest uh, training that you have have for some some children? Well, I can say that children age of thirteen and fourteen, their ice time ends at half past ten, half past nine in so, the evening. In the evening, so that's not the good option. Yeah, I, I I remember when I was playing Finnish baseball, we had some some training which was yeah we called it the bat <laughs> time for the bats, bats and and it's it's pretty intensive usually the training and it really delayed the the sleeping time because it took you easily easily like two hours that you can can go to sleep after that sometimes three hours and then you have this one training. I think it was Wednesday, and then you kind of mess up the whole whole rhythm with this this one training in in the middle of the week, and I I found it really really annoying and trying to sleep when you are recovering from a from a vigorous vigorous training. So yeah, that's I think the studying the sleep wake pattern of of children and adolescents would be would be very interesting. Yeah, and I think a lot of sports studies have made about the late evening practice sessions and how they compare to sleep and if we have to wake up very early in the next morning to have a morning session the day is getting very long and with that we don't have enough recovery during the night so it will have a lot of different kind of injuries get sick have the overuse injuries because Not maybe not because of we are training too much or we're too physically active, but because we don't get enough recovery during our days. Mm. And and I think many times in the athletic training, it's not paid enough how many hours there are between the training sessions. Like like if you have a late evening training and then early morning training, it's not not a long time to to recover. But if you if you for example have a very hard training in the morning and then the next training is next day in the evening you actually get like get the very very long recovery so i think that's also something that can be if if the times are flexible you can you can use it to your advantage yeah and i think that's one of the key points we have to focus on that for sports we think that we should have one day off for every mm. week that we get enough recovery but if we work out on Wednesday morning, let's say 8 to 9 a.m. And then when our next practice session is Thursday, 5 p.m., we get over 24 hours of recovery during that time. So mm-hmm. that should be enough. So instead of days, we should focus more on how to count the hours for recovery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And and especially if you have an easier training training there, you can have actually like two days of not having hard training when you when you just kind of schedule it so i i agree maybe it's just like a rule of thumb idea that for people it's easier to understand that you should have one day off per week but i don't i don't really fully agree with that i've been i've been training in a way that sometimes i don't have a day off for three months and i i think it has been has been fine Yeah, and I think that's also that, especially for the athletes and coach education systems that we say that speed and power workouts, they have to do after the rest day. Mm. If we look at the rest days, it should be the day we don't do any vigorous activities or we don't practice hard. So Mm. why do we think about that one day? And maybe on the second day we have morning session instead of evening session. We get half it, one and a half days of training because that we have to get that one practice session in that similar mm. time. Yeah, yeah, and I I think it's interesting the having a day off. Uh, maybe it's a good sign that usually the training after having a day off it feels much more difficult. It's I think the body kind of goes to sleep and then the next training will be will be usually pretty not feeling very good and and then the body kind of wakes up 
So yeah, there's probably some some people listening who know who have been doing studies more about the physiology of having a having a day off. But is it important that the body kind of goes to sleep mode and then the next training is harder, or is it actually bad for the you kind of miss miss two days of of training when you have the day off and then the next day it doesn't really feel too good at least at least for me and for some people yeah and i think one of the learning points from especially in our club was that when we had the saturday and sunday games and then we have the off day on monday and then we find out that during the tuesday practice sessions we are not fully awake and fully ready to be explosive and powerful so yes. instead of being doing the speed work or something else on Tuesday, maybe we use more for the endurance and fitness work or strength training instead of that power speed practice session. And we schedule that session later on the week when we are fully awake, we are ready to practice again. Mm. It's always finding the suitable way for your coaching team, that players that find that right place for different time of practice sessions. What are the differences between, for let's say, if you are having a more sports education or physical education in voluntary school or upper secondary school or in high school, how the differences come from the control group to intervention group, how to develop the physical activity during the school days? Or mm. doing the sports practice. I think one of the also that the interesting parts is nowadays that active school learning experiences that we have a chances to improve the activity and phys- really physical activity during the school days. But improve those with longitudinal research setting three months, four months, five months. Basically, we can get the whole semester in one study and how that changes our physical activity during the school days. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good points. And and you said RCT is just uh, saying it uh, open, so randomized controlled trials, uh, if somebody is not familiar with the term. And and about the active learning, I had a, earlier a good recording with Andrew Daly Smith about uh, active learning. So if if any of the listeners are interested in that, I would I would recommend a very very good good episode from and good insights from from Andy there. Yeah, so that that's an interesting interesting idea to study how how to improve the school days, how how it affects maybe in the in the learning of of children. I I believe there is a big a probably big effect on learning because you, if we sit all day and try to try to learn in the afternoon, I think it it's definitely not an optimal way. But I think we need good studies to show that and see how it how it actually works. Yeah, and I think in nowadays what I have found out is that the classrooms they are quite playful in many places, so it's nice that. Teachers have more tools to get the kids active during the lessons. Maybe use the jump balls or stand up, use some kind of active learning or methods that we can have more physical activity and maybe keep the kids awake and alert all the time during the lessons. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and in Finland and I think in most of the Nordic countries, we haven't had school uniforms but for example if you look in uk the kids have a tie and they have like a leather shoes and i from from the outsider's perspective i think that should really be changed that it definitely doesn't encourage for activity when you are having a white collar shirt tie and a, and a leather shoes so i think that could be one study just to test that if you let kids to have sports shoes and and more sporty clothes how would that that affect or if it's if they want to stick with the school uniform does it need to be a tie and and leather shoes yeah i think more use for the trainer should be necessary for the kids also that 
basically in everything what we do with the children nowadays, we should always think that is this making them more physical activity? Because the smaller children, when they are in the play grounds or when they are doing the daycare, they are active because that days don't have too much learning lessons or maybe they use something, they play games, they learn how to combine with the other children, how they can improve their health, how much they can move. We can keep the toddlers on the ground, they explore their moves. And that's one way that if we are allowing that in the smaller children, why don't we allow that for the older children and adolescents also? Mm -hmm. Let them explore, find the physical activity from different points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I like it. So that's a that's a good idea for research research design. Did you have some some more still? Uh, maybe not too much, but all the time getting more and more ideas. So yeah, I think what is that? My, my findings from my master's thesis, which is not published yet, yeah, is that it's the same finding that in other studies that when the children grow up the physical activity levels decrease. So we have to focus on what happens when they are aged 12, 13, 14, mm-hmm. how we can maintain the physical activity levels. And that is kind of interesting. And I think it should be one of the key points researching in the future is that because the children are active when they're younger, how we can maintain and increase the physical activity then we have the healthier society, better well-being students all the time. And I think it will also improve our learning in mathematics or English or Finnish or some other st- subjects. So mm. that's kind of one of the interesting. I think yeah. about one of also that in a, if I think about my elementary school and secondary school, it was kind of that when we went to the secondary school, we stopped moving during the recess. We just sit mm. there and watch what happens and stay on our mobile phones and so on. But when we were in elementary school, we just played football and basketball and so on. So how we can still understand that it's important to stay active during the school days. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, did you also have in your master's thesis that the intensity level drops? It's not only the physical activity amount, but it's a change in intensity. Yeah, so basically the moderate to vigorous intensity levels drop all the way from starting from the first class in Finland, which they are seven years old. And in the ninth grade, when they are 15, we don't get not even a 10% of activity levels in moderate to vigorous activity intensities in mm. the ninth grade compared to first class so that's kind of that it's worrying me that mm. if we don't get the moderate to vigorous activity enough what that will mean means in 15 years 20 years for our society that we don't have the experience to move and stay physical active all the time Hmm. And and how 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 is your view of the uh, physical activity recommendation for children? You are you are working with the athletic athletes, uh, young athletes, and and have been doing your master's thesis on this. What's what's your your take on the on the recommendations? I think that in, I was in a blurred spot because I thought that when we are doing this student athletes and sport club participants, we move enough. But in reality, we don't move enough because we have so many other children who doesn't participate in sports. They don't get the activity of physical activity enough. So I think one of the things we have to focus more in the future is that what is the vigorous physical activity? How that affect our health and well-being compared to moderate and compared to light physical activity. That should be one of the key points in the future. 
do we get enough changes? Does it affect in our health, well-being? Also, if we look at the endothelial health and so on, we can find out from the research that more active students and, and athletes, they have better endothelial health compared mm. to those who don't move enough. So what mm. are the differences there and how we can improve that everybody is gaining enough vigorous physical activity and moderate physical activity during the days? Mm. And yeah, I, I think the endothelial, so studying the, the veins and veins and arteries, I think it's it's a very interesting study. I think that's that's kind of what we haven't studied as much. We always talk about the heart, we talk about the lungs, we talk about the muscle endurance, the local local adaptations, but I think the endothelial system is something that is very interesting and anyway it's it's super important for different uh, cardiovascular diseases. It's it's important. I think it's it's probably important in in long COVID also. Uh, there's some studies showing that. So I think it's a it's a very interesting field of study to see how how exercise, how physical activity affects the the endothelial system. Yeah, and I think that this whole COVID pandemic has been great learning experience for us and now we have to find out when we were in the closed doors all the time and we were worrying about do the children move enough and actually in some cases they started to move in more when they didn't have to go to school or some other things so maybe now we have to focus that let's keep those activity levels high and also, we can then learn about the whole COVID more, that how it affects our health and well-being in the long term. Because now most of us had had the COVID, so maybe it will change us health in the long term. Mm, yeah, there's some, some studies showing that at least one year after even non-symptomatic uh, COVID, you, you still have changes that increase the risk for for several diseases so we will we will see how how that goes but i think i think very good good points do you have anything to add in the discussion of of training or, or physical activity of of children i uh, know not at the moment i'm just happy that i was able to be visiting this podcast and get to be part of the fibion during my internship so I would recommend to have, if you have a chance to do internship and you are excited about the physical activity and well-being and health, to contact the Fibion and find out more about the possibilities to do the internship at Fibion. Mm, and and to say, I, I think it's it's very interesting to see whether it's a startup or a scale up, to see that how <clears throat> how dynamic, how fast moving it is and when you don't have have a big structure of a company that you can basically do everything right away. So I, w- I would recommend whether it's Fibion or any any other company, I would recommend doing internship. I think it's a, it's a good learning experience. And, and if, you, if you're interested in doing an internship in Fibion, just let me know. And, and we are basically a virtual organization in a way that the location doesn't make a difference if you have a decent internet connection that's that's just fine fine and also Jaco was doing it it from the distance distance and how 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 were your experiences doing doing virtual how how do you find the communication and and different things things working when we couldn't see face to face i think that it was working great because we had the video calls, easy way to do it. So contact, use the WhatsApp. We had the Google meetings with the whole team. And it's kind of easy because we don't have to get together, get together in the same place at the same time. Everybody is able to work how they can find it best for themselves. So it was, for my side at least, it was very nice because I was able to control my schedule more 
I was able to use working hours better when I had the time and when I, for example, I had to coach, I was able to coach without too many stress that I have to do this and this and have to be there. So mm. that was a great experience for me. Yeah, yeah, nice, really nice to hear. And maybe I can share your your practical way of of managing your time. Many times when I had a, had a video call with Jaco, he was in the in the drying room in the in the ice hockey hall. So basically, they have a big space for where the there's a kind of closets where you can dry the clothes. So because Jaco was coaching there, and then he had a couple of hours, so he didn't cycle back home, but just just went to this this room i think it's a it's a really good time management because otherwise you would be just shuttling between different places yeah and it kind of was also working for me because i learned that way that for example i coach for an hour do the work for three hours then i go for the lunch or have some gym session or something else and it was easy then i was able to get back work a couple hours more and then i had the practice session again instead of that i will go for the ice ring go back home and then work and then go back to the ice ring and maybe need to work some more so it saves me a lot of time and it was kind of for me it was fun and nice experience to have yeah yeah i i fully agree so it was it was pleasure to have you as an intern and it was pleasure to do this podcast i think you did super well and very nice nice research research ideas which are free to be stolen if, if any of the listeners are are interested so thank you Jaco, for taking the time for this this podcast yes thank you Oli, also